weekends, we practice with three cheap electric guitars and a broken down microphone, all jacked into a bottom of the line Sears Silvertone amp screaming chaos, distortion, and glory up. We take breaks on canvas stretch cuts in a plywood chicken shack that Staley's father built for us before the accident. Smoking cigarettes, we talk for hours as Johnny Falk burns the girls in Playboy with his butt. I stole two soda cans full of old Taylor bourbon from my father's supply and mixed it with grapefruit juice. We try to drink it. No. We try to drink it, but it tastes bad. Really bad. Staley drinks the whole thing fast without saying much. In about 20 minutes, he is finished. Soon he's writhing on the ground, talking in a strange, knocked out dialect, saying it's cold like Alaska, freezing in here. Shivering and moaning, he's holding himself, rolling back and forth in the middle of June. His face looks vacant and comatose. Suddenly, he takes his penis out and pulls it hard. Through clenched teeth, he hisses to himself, Where's Ricky? Where's Ricky? This empties the chicken shack immediately in an explosive homophobic fire drill. We scramble over each other and through the door. Mrs. Staley is standing right outside, feet wide apart and arms folded. She's wearing high heels, French cut shorts, and a tight cashmere sweater. She puffs a cigarette and asks, what's going on, boys? She looks directly into my eyes. Nothing, Mrs. Staley, I say. I think Ricky's sick. As she ducks into the hut to take a look, we make our getaway. I know she will think that it's my fault he ended up in this state. I hope she won't call my parents. Sometimes, the way she stares makes me wonder what's on her mind. Her husband is in a wheelchair. I always notice Staley's hair. It's long, jet black, and brill creamed. He's half English and half Spanish. His skin is white, white. He never goes to the beach. His glasses are the cheap, clear, plastic kind with a wire running through the frames. Behind thick lenses, his eyes look small. After two years in the army stationed in Germany, he's come home. His father died while he was away. As I walk into the family room, Staley is maniacally scribbling chemical reactions on a blackboard mounted on the wall. His mother seems impressed by his new passion to become a chemist. She seems like a much older woman now. His style is flamboyant as he chain smokes unfiltered Paul Malls, talks about his drug experiences and chemistry. He tells me how in stimulants his body became a pure frequency. Existence converted to a single cosmic sine wave. Far out, I say. I am actually interested in these otherworldly states. He invites me into his bedroom and pulls out a Gretsch semi-hollow body electric. He begins to play shapes of things before my eyes by the yard birds. Flawless, perfect distortion perfect rhythm. I could literally hear the other guitar parts being played. When he finishes, he asks, did you hear it? Yes, I say. We don't pursue it beyond that. It's amazing and beyond explanation. He has transformed himself with a wild, stylized discipline. I saw his old friends, Philip K. and Rick Vassell at Leo's Stereo. They told me that Staley had taken Reds and run a light at 3 a.m. He killed some people. 
Kay and Vassell were smiling nervously. They told me that Staley was in the hospital for a few weeks before he died. Vassell said he had been in the car with Staley. Remember what my nose used to look like? Look at it now. He turned to show me a profile. I was in the hospital for six weeks, he said, and they removed part of my intestines. He lifted his shirt to show me the scar. I'm an auto mechanic now, and I married this beautiful chick. You wouldn't believe it. She's a former model, and I bought a house in Lawndale. Philip K. started telling me about his 1962 Chevrolet Lowrider with hydraulic lifters and a six-speaker Munts Blue Light Stereo. He continued to talk, but I couldn't hear what he was saying. I was thinking about a knocked-out dialect, screaming chaos, distortion, and Gloria.